Good. Yes, we are. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to part two on our neurodiversity series, which is going to be or has been kicked off with um, autism and Asperger's. And we've had a part one with with Bill uh, last week and we're following it up with um, this week. We're doing stories of hope. We have a panel who are going to be sharing we've got three people on our panel and we will also uh, be hearing from each of them about what what is it that their experience with autism has been either um, I think in all cases with others and then what is it that that the insights they've had in their experience and what is it that they found you know really provides helpfulness peace of mind hope in this in this area and what they found as a carer or a parent, what has been, or, or as a clinical practitioner in the case of Bill, what have they come to see through their own experience is really of service. So we're going to have quite a lot of time today on storytelling and real life experience. And uh, I'll introduce our panel in a moment. What will follow? So we'll have about half the time on um, what people have seen in real life has been helpful in their own understanding around uh, autism. And then we'll have uh, the second part be about Q&A. So we're going to do questions and hopefully answers. Tonight, we're not going to be doing ADHD. So if you didn't get the memo, I'm so sorry. We tried to contact everyone and say that we were going to use this session to do Q&A on autism and Asperger's. And we are going to do two sessions in January same format, we're going to do a masterclass on ADHD and follow up with some stories and some Q&A. So you're getting double. You're getting double, everybody. We've decided that we couldn't do it justice in one hour or one hour and a quarter. So you're getting two sessions on autism and you're getting two sessions on ADHD. So if anybody's here expecting us to be talking in depth about ADHD, we won't be, but we definitely will be in January. So feel free to hop off if that's what you came for and you're in the wrong place. But otherwise, you'll also find that there'll be some very helpful stories in general about neurodiversity and how that works and the difference between the brain and a spiritual understanding of our mind. So today, it's stories of hope and, uh, you know, real life experience and Q&A live. So if you've got questions, we definitely want to hear from you. But perhaps hold them until we've heard our storytellers, because it really is a very beautiful thing when we can give our full presence attention and open our hearts to the stories that we're going to be told now. So I invite you to just fully embrace that and maybe hold on comments and questions until that part is done. And then we can really um, take it. Then we'll take a deep dive into all the, the questions and answers. So. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to, uh, for anybody that perhaps didn't hear or didn't attend the first part one, which was the masterclass, just where we're coming from on this idea of neurodiversity, which is um, really two main things that come to mind right now, but I'm sure there'll be more. One is that di neurodiversity, like any diversity, is, is necessary. It's helpful. It's valuable, useful, wanted and needed difference just like all the trees all the plants in the forest all the animals and the birds are needed they're all different they all perform different function have different strengths and weaknesses the fern doesn't do well if if it wants to be an oak tree i mean i don't know what a fern actually thinks but you know it, it it's meant to be a fern and work the way a fern works and really so do we we are all unique and different and individual and we all have our own brain processor and we're different and different is good. Different is needed. So first of all, I suppose in a way, you know, we're different and maybe there's nothing wrong that we're different. So that's one of the things to acknowledge. And yet there are limits and there are brain processing differences. So that, that's true too. We're coming from the point of view of there is a difference in the brain processor, the biology, the brain. But the essence of who someone is, well, that's another matter entirely. 
So we're distinguishing brain processor, the physical, the form. In this conversation, we're going to touch on that diagnosis, but we're going to really look towards and point to the spiritual understanding before the brain, before the difference, before the separate brain processor. And that's where hope lies. So um, I've got uh, my dear friend, colleague, partner in crime and fellow mother, Catherine Chidiak. Uh, she's on our panel and she's a, a mother. She found out when her son was quite young that he had an autism diagnosis or just she, she found out that that was what was happening. And she's been on a roller coaster ride as a mother, as you can imagine any mother would be, uh, to find their, their child in, at a young age struggling. And so really she's going to be here sharing her perspective as a mother. We've actually got two mothers on the panel. Um, we've got Dr. Bill, who I'm going to also introduce, as, as many of you will already know and love, who is a psychiatrist with, with, I think, nearly 50 years or over 50 years of experience, and at least 30 of those with an understanding of um, our, the, the spiritual aspect of our nature and the impact and understanding of that can have on any psychiatric diagnoses. He's been board certified. I'm not going to read his CV today. I did that last time. But basically, he knows what he's talking about in the area of psychiatry and has massive amounts of experience. But more than that, he has a desire to really be of service and come from love. And what becomes possible when we do that? And so he's witnessed both, he understands the technicality of a psychiatric diagnosis, but also what's possible when, when we meet in this spiritual understanding. And he's witnessed that and been part of that and contributed that. So he's a lot to offer from a clinical point of view. Uh, and then I'm going to leave it to Dr. Bill to introduce um, our third panel guest today. And in fact, that's who we'll be, I'll be going to first. Um, we're very lucky because he quoted from her book last time. For those of you who were lucky on the call, lucky enough to be on the call last week, you'll have heard him quote from the Space of Love and the author Gail Noble. And Dr. Bill had the brilliant idea to invite Gail to be with us tonight. So, Bill, would you like to just say a little bit about Gail? Because I know you've you've in, interacted with her before. Oh, we just need to. You need to unmute. You need to unmute, Bill. Can we unmute, Bill? Hey, there you go. You're there. So I'm going to once again show the space of love. And um, not only the text and the descriptions, but the, the poetry uh, that I, and I wrote, read only maybe three of seven or eight poems that are so very powerful. And um, I just, um, by Gail Noble, I just encourage you um, to do that. Um, shortly after, and, and Gail will have to help me, but my wife Linda and I moved to Phoenix uh, four years ago, June, four days before our first, um, uh, her, her only daughter from her late husband's, uh, from her late husband, uh, from their marriage, uh, four days before our, our grandson uh, arrived. Uh, we we came here and now there's another one, a little two year old, two and a half year old. In fact, they just left. Um, the two and a half year old um, came in as I was finishing a session, asking if I would play hide and seek, right? And um, uh, just very quickly, I you know Bill Bill has to tell a story um, that might seem unrelated, but. Um, I've always had trouble telling the difference between an alligator and a crocodile. And I've felt kind of bad about it because I've only looked up the difference 20 times, I think, but I forget. So little, little Alex, who's two and a half, which I can't imagine that I was able to do this at two and a half, but he was taking these cards that had a letter on it and then it had an animal. And he'd say, L, L is for lion, Arr! you know, uh, S, S is for sheep, bah. and he's doing this, and he gets to A, he says, and A is for crocodile, 
because <laughs> he looked at the picture. <laughs> I thought, oh, good. I'm not the only one that has trouble telling the difference. But anyway, but I met Gail shortly after um, with, I think, a mutual friend, uh, Ellen and Jerry Friedman, who uh, uh, welcomed us to the Three Principles community in Phoenix. And I met Gail at, at that time. If I'm not correct, Gail can help me with that. But Gail uh, will tell her story of an uh, adult, um, a male child that uh, it, beautiful um, uh, story. Uh, and this was Gail's uh, third book, Space of Love. She had written two books earlier and uh, had been active, uh, if you will, uh, in the uh, in the autism um, uh, uh, field to, to trying to uh, find her own um, some uh, some peace of mind about it and and helping others. So I'm going to turn it over to Gail. She's she's a friend. She's a, um, a wonderful uh, uh, author and a three principles um, uh, explorer and student like I am. Gail. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. yeah, I guess it has been four years. I think we might have had some online contact before that. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think we did. But um, yeah, so I've been walking this walk for most of my life, I guess, in different formats. My brother is um, 61, and he has autism. And of course, that was back when we blamed the mother for cold mothering. So things have come a long way since then, but that was one of the theories that was around and my poor mother had to sort of be a part of that. Um, and then my oldest of my three children, um, who just, he just turned 38 and he has autism as well. And he and my brother are a lot alike, very, very similar. So it's, it's been a really long journey for me. Um, Gosh, I don't know where to start. You want me to talk a little bit about my son first or? Yeah, just, just your experience with autism. How, how have you come to become it, this to become such an important topic for you? Who in your life has, you know, okay. just whatever makes sense. And then just naturally move on to what you've seen for yourself. Okay. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, it's been my life. <laughs> I guess I'd have to say that it's been my life. First with my brother who was institutionalized really young and I didn't really grow up with him in my life. And then there's always the wondering whether your own child's gonna have autism or not. And sure enough, that's how things turned out. Um, I homeschooled him for a really, really long time. Uh, he didn't go to school till he was a teenager. So I ran a program out of my home where people came in to work with him and I was in charge of it because I had a special education background um, that I had before, you know, before I had my son. Um, so I did that for a really long time. And um, then when I decided it was time for him to be in school, that was a whole process of trying to figure out where he was going to go to school and so forth. Um, and, and I'll also just say that my, his name is Kyle and his challenges are really significant. So he's really not able to take care of himself. He always has to have somebody with him taking care of his basic needs. He's not verbal. He has what I'll call add-ons that kind of go along with his autism, other challenges that he faces. So it's pretty significant. Um, and then when he went off to school, I felt a little lost because the running of his program and just being so, so involved was a really big piece of my life. So he was in school, my younger two kids were in school and I wasn't sure what to do with myself, I guess I'll say. Um, so I started writing. I had been sort of dabbling in writing and I, I ended up writing a book with a friend. That was my first book and then along came a second book. And of course, this was before this understanding. So the books were mainly sharing stories and somewhat sharing techniques, kind of on how to live well with this big challenge. Um, and I have to say the process of being a mom and an advocate 
for my son has been very much, even before this understanding that we're talking about here, has been very much a personal growth journey for myself. Because I always say, I mean, he's taught me how to be a better human. And this was happening all along. Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest things that we struggle with, so he's 38, um, as parents are not just the day-to-day -day things, but we worry a lot about what's going to happen in the future. And our minds can just go off, you know, our personal minds just go off in crazy directions. You know, we just really, really worry a lot. And some people might say, well, rightly so. Your son's never going to be able to live on his own or take care of himself. Um, but it can be really consuming. And when we realize that this journey is just a moment, is actually just a moment to moment, doing the best we can in each moment. Our child is doing the best they can. It might not always look like it, but gosh, given what I know that he has going on in, in his brain, life is really challenging for him. And, and we as parents feel like, oh my gosh, this is so challenging for us. Well, yeah, but our kids, like they have to be in a world that um, doesn't understand them very well and that is really difficult at times to process. So, um, oh my gosh, I forgot where I was going with that. I was going someplace. Um, oh, the, the worrying about the future, but what really happens is you begin to see over time because it's been so long for me is that you just take one step at a time and then you do the next thing and you do the next thing and pretty soon you're kind of in that future that you are so afraid of and you realize it's okay, you know, um, that it's okay that you'll figure it out. And, and that's one of the things that I love about this understanding is talking about the power of wisdom or whatever you want to call it, is that everything gets figured out in real time. Like every single thing. Even though we get in our heads about things and we're worried about the future and then you get there and you're like, okay, I just took a million steps to get here. And I'm going to take a million steps after this. And I just figure it out in, in real time. And it's okay. Mm, I love that, Gail. So much wisdom in that. Yeah. Yeah. And I just see that so clearly. The more time goes by, the more that that becomes so clear. And I think the other thing that I've seen, too, is... Um, Part of the, the thing that feels like a struggle is that, and it's, it's a normal human tendency, you know, as a parent, we're res, kind of in a resistant state. Um, this isn't what we expected, although in my case, I kind of half expected it maybe or knew that it could be possible, but um, this isn't what we ordered when we put in our order to have a child, you know. Um, and we're kind of in resistance to it, that this, this shouldn't be, this, this should not have happened. Whether or not you're aware that that's kind of what's in your mind, I think there's an underlying current of that. And I know that even for myself, even in phases, so my son, Kyle, also has epilepsy. And when he was little, it was a big issue. It's not anymore, he's controlled, but when he was little, he wasn't controlled. And he went through a really rough period when he was two of just out of out of control seizures and um, lots of meds and taking him off of meds and just, it, it was a rough time. I was pregnant with my second child. And um, afterwards, the few words that he did have that he was able to say disappeared. Like a whole lot of things disappeared from him. He regressed, I would say. 
And I spent so much time in my head struggling against (laughs) that. Like that should not have happened. That is not fair. Like, you know, he was struggling to get those words and he had them and now they're gone. Like the slate, the computer disc was wiped clean. And I think that when we're able to kind of fall out of, of that resistance and, you know, those moments where you're simply with your child and enjoying them and being with them where they are and, and the resistance drops away, everything feels kind of like it's okay. I don't know how to ex- explain that very well, but I know that I wrote something in the book and I can't remember if it's one of the things that you read. It might have been Space of Love. Um, and it had to do with show- showering Kyle or shaving him or something like that. And I still have moments like that. Um, although I don't, he's actually living in his own home now with caregivers, but I'm having to fill in a lot. So I was with him last night and I was shaving him this morning and I had that kind of moment when I'm like, oh, okay, we're okay. We're all right here. I'm shaving you and you're pushing me away and doing all this, but I don't know when you kind of, it's, it's like, um, I guess it's a dropping away from the resistance to what is what is so beautiful yeah yeah and it can be okay I mean he he's okay I don't think he even has a notion that he might not be okay although I don't know because he can't say but um I could see where he's gone through all these things but he's 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 still okay and I could see it you look at him and you kind of get a feel for that. Um, it's so beautiful what you say, Gail. It's so simple. We look over there, but but when we look, drop the resistance, what returns, we, we find ourselves, uh, if I may say, in the space of love. Mm-hmm. So beautiful. Yeah. 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 And, you know, you can't force yourself to be there. Like I always, I like to emphasize because when Kyle was really little, we sort of came in contact with a philosophy that said, happiness is a choice. And your attitude when you're with your child is gonna make a difference. Well, we know that our attitude, I agree, but I don't know that we can choose or kind of force those kinds of things. Like if we're, I guess you'd say in a low state of mind, we're not going to be happy. And I don't know if we could push that we can push ourselves to a state where we will be, but eventually we will be. Mm. We'll just be there. And I think knowing that for me, I think getting into the difference that this understanding has made is that it takes some of the pressure off. Because mm. I felt before, like, well, if happiness is a choice, then I need to will myself to be happy and to be okay all the time because that's what was going to help Kyle well what's nice is knowing that I I guess I would correct that to say happiness is available and those feelings of peace are available all the time but you can't force those things and that's okay that's okay that he's going to be okay, even if my attitude isn't isn't as great as I thought it should be. So um, I kind of realized that too, because I think when he was younger, I really believed that I wasn't doing enough and I could do some things that really mess things up because as parents, we're kind of floundering all over the place trying to figure out what to do. And now it's probably a thousandfold because you know, he was born in 1983 and we didn't have any internet and we didn't have as many interventions and programs available. There were just a few. So I didn't have as many choices, but now I can't even imagine being a new parent and getting online and just being like, what do I choose? And then the, it would be easy to have the, the idea that 
what you're doing is never quite good enough or never enough or you should be doing that thing or should be doing this thing. Um, so I think that's another place where I think wisdom is so amazing that I think you can trust the directions that you're led to walk off in. Mm. And then if it looks like it's time to make a change, which we did many times with many different things, you will make a change and that you, you'll figure that out. Beautiful. Gail, that's so lovely. And I, what I heard in what you said was you don't even have to resist your own low mood. You just let it all come and go knowing yeah. that you and they are okay. That's what I heard there. Very yeah, beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. And resisting your, not that I'm perfect at it, but I think <laughs> this understanding, I think I allow much more of that low mood um, mm. and it takes a lot of the pressure off. Mm. It's, it's one less swirl of thinking, you know, um, just knowing, you know, this will shift. Hmm. Um, and it's always amazing. I'm always sort of, actually, I'm always sort of a little surprised sometimes at how it shifts and how things look different. Mm. You know, something that one day looks one way and then you, wake up the next day and it looks so different and you mm -hmm. didn't do anything you just went to sleep you know you just went to sleep and I'm always like wow well yesterday I felt so bad about this and mm. now it's like I don't know what the big deal was you know so I think that so much applies to the journey with autism mm. um, I love that yeah um, we're going to come back to you, Gail, when we do the panel Q&A, but I'm just going to move us on now to Kat's story because you said something about, imagine be, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have a diagnosis of a younger child and all the information that's out there and all the things you've got to wade through. And that's exactly what Kat Chidiak had to do. So she, I think her son's at 11, is that right? Uh, ish? And 12. 12, just turned 12. Um, so she's obviously in that camp where, you know, in the last 12 years, She's, um, well, I'm going to let her tell her story, but she's also a mother of an autistic son. And, and Kat, really, what's your experience with autism and what insights have you had and how has this understanding helped you? Welcome, first of all. <laughs> well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks so much, Gail. That was, I feel like, yes, yes, yes. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, and Bill, last week, that was just brilliant. I loved it. Um, I actually took some notes here, but... So what do I want to say? I think, um, I mean, I'll tell you a little bit about my son and our journey. Um, very similar to Gail, actually, but um, what, I, what I really related to Gail was this, I was pregnant during the, from the very first meeting I had that they, they raised a concern with my son. He was only two. Um, and then there was a year of diagnosis and I was pretty much pregnant that entire year. And I got the final diagnosis just before I gave birth to my third son. And I, I can honestly say, I think that made me slightly more mad about the whole thing because I really got this idea that, well, first of all, there was a lot of resistance, which was incredibly painful for me. I did not want that diagnosis. I, I had made it mean something um, about me, about the future, about life. Um, that I, I was finding very hard to face at that time. And, you know, going online and facing the wealth of ideas around autism, I still say like, you know, when people talk to me, when I say, oh, my son's got this diagnosis and they say, oh yeah, autism, it's this, this and this. And I just used to think, the more I know, the less I know almost, you know, it's, you know, you meet one child, you meet one child or you hear, um, it's such a, broad spectrum of experience. But um, I really struggled with that in that very early phase. And it was quite a short, sharp time for me. So I basically got a lot of ideas about something that might have happened to him. And I followed a lot of rabbit holes into what might happen to children that they get autism. I also went down the whole future scenario. Um, and my son also had regressive autism. It was very terrifying to me because 
when I first started, they started raising concerns. There was, there was really clearly no issue to me, apart from that he wasn't speaking as much as maybe other children. And then slowly, slowly over the course of a year, I could see that he was literally sort of spinning in circles all day long by the end of that year. So I, did, I, I also have this sort of the sense, I didn't, I didn't know where we were headed with this. They, they said to me upon diagnosis, he might never speak because at that point he then lost all willingness to communicate verbally. Um, and this was at times really terrifying to me. I, I actually felt I can honestly say terror. I, I didn't know what that was. I didn't know if I could cope with that. I didn't know if we could cope with it. I didn't know what, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know. I was in the unknown. And I remember it was about a year of this, you know, up all night on the internet, <laughs> coming down many, many a rabbit hole. And um, I remember sitting on my bed, I had my newborn with me, not so newborn, but a baby. And um, my son, Cannon, who is 12, um, was playing in the other room. He was probably about four years old, three, three, four years old at that point. And he was just, you know, doing what he did, which was kind of lining things up and just lining things up. And I just, I just got this feeling of absolute <coughs> stress and panic just sort of came over me. And instead of just doing that, which is what I'd been doing for the last year and a half, something happened that day. I literally saw something so helpful to me that I think changed the trajectory of how I came to be with that, came to be with my son, came to be with our experience. And that was, if I don't think about the future, that he might need care, that what happens if something happens to me? What, what if, what if, what if? I don't do that. And I don't think about the past, what happened? What could I do differently? What, what I should have done, could have, could have. If I didn't do that right now, we were okay. <laughs> and Gail, you spoke to that as well. And it was, but for me, it really was that kind of, ah, oh, moment, <laughs> I kind of, we're okay right now and it was really this epiphany for me that nothing needed to change right now we were okay I could I could deal with whatever was happening right now um and that really changed a lot for me I think that was I was very stuck in almost these sort of real repetitive patterns of just going forward and back and you know just anguish actually and all from a space of not being okay and not knowing what to do, not knowing what we needed to do. Um, and then um, I'm probably gonna jump around a bit now, but I came across someone quite early on who said to me, within a conversation, but I heard the words presume competence. And again, for me, that was a real game changer because it was before I came across the principles that we're kind of orientating around here, but it, it, something about it just, you know, my inner wisdom just, I just grabbed that. I just knew there was something true about that. Presume competence. I just felt like there was something true. And we did a lot. And um, my poor son got kind of, and my newborn baby actually, <laughs> got dragged around quite a few different places, people. We tried all sorts of funny things and and um I too Gail did quite a bit of homeschooling initially um but he is actually in mainstream school now and I want to kind of jump to now because you know I almost laugh it's unlike you Gail you know my son went ended up in mainstream school and slowly 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 we it was very slow but and again step by step which I love the way you talk to that that just you know those little steps he started to develop the capacity to communicate, to engage. Um, and it took a long time. But when we started to get that, I, I became very hopeful. I saw, um, yes, it might not look normal, whatever normal is, because I've got four kids and I think they're all pretty different, actually. But, he was learning, he was in a very different way, the same thing, you know, um, slowly, slowly learning new little things. And um, 
I kind of took the presumed competence and I really treated Canon like I treated all my children, which was um, to encourage learning, which is our natural being. Um, and I, I wouldn't be able to put that in words, but that's, that's really what's happened. And he's gone into mainstream school and he's, he had to work a lot harder at some points, you know. But now I, I literally get, I was laughing with my husband the other day, we literally get a postcard every week saying how proud we should be of him. <laughs> it's like, we're really proud, I promise you. Um, because he's doing very well. And, you know, there was a few things that led to that, you know, he started to get very into Lego and he didn't have very good dexterity. And that, again, he just was playing with Lego 24 seven. He would just sort of wake up and build these amazing dinosaurs and creations. And then he'd take them all apart. And then the next day he'd build another one. Um, so he started doing certain things that were engaging. He was creating. And, um, you know, now I, I work with young people and I work, I work with quite a few young people who have autism. I teach in mainstream schools. We have, you know, young people with autism in the classes. Um, I've also worked with you know, young adults who are, who want to thrive in life. And, you know, what I loved about what Dr. Bill was saying last week, because this is the way I see it. Um, you know, these, we all work fundamentally the same way you know we we learn we evolve maybe it's at different rates maybe it's in different ways but there's this sort of creative capacity within us and you know it's not that it kind of just started at secondary school and and he can become very anxious about the future also but boy do I relate to that you know and it might look a bit different and he can get very anxious and he still has a few little stimulatory things he does, you know, but I really relate to him, you know? Yeah, when you think about all the things we have to do at school, it's stressful, me too. You know, there's a whole lot of ideas about what should happen and could happen and yeah, I'm, I work the same. And we're just more alike than we are different. You know, our bodies fundamentally work the same way. Our minds fundamentally work the same way. We'll feel what we think. Um, and there's, what he's really taught me is, you know, I have to remember this with my other kids because just everything he does is just so wonderful to me. Um, and I can't say my other poor children don't quite care. <laughs> You know, everything they does doesn't look quite as wonderful to me. Um, and what a lovely lesson there is there. Mm -hmm. Because my expectations are... I just enjoy him. Um, I enjoy if he creates things. I enjoy um, just his being. Um, and that's a really lovely lesson to me as a mother for my other children, you know, because it can really look like, you know, when we're parenting that we need to control so much of it and we need to make this happen and that, and we just miss, we don't enjoy it. Mm. Kind of miss that enjoyment of it. And um, Ken has really taught me that. Beautiful, Kat. I love how, um, how enriched, you, I, I feel you've been by canon in your life and I can, that really comes over in your storytelling. And just for anyone listening, we're not prescribing anything on this call about what to do, no. but, but I, but Kat and bo both Gail and Kat, it speaks to their own wisdom guiding them. So, so for another autistic child, it may not be the thing to go be sent to a normal school, but you knew, Absolutely. you knew for you and for canon that something in you was was guided to do that and you listened. And I think that's it throughout your whole story. But I'll I'll just give you a chance to, if you can summarize in essence, impossible, but what it is that this understanding that we talk about and that you teach, what impact has that made on you as a parent with an autistic son? 
I mean, so many. Um, what, what I loved about coming across this understanding is it made sense of those wisdoms that I did have, that mm -hmm. sense that I kind of knew what was right. And, and, and sifting through all the advice, all the, and you know, we're all up against that advice, you know, to what is going to give us optimal performance in life? You know, how are we gonna, <laughs> what do we do? Do we meditate all day? And do we do this and that and this and that, you know, do well in our jobs. Um, you know, sifting through all the kind of noise of life, um, there is always a wisdom for us. And exactly, you know, I'm really glad you picked up on that, Elizabeth, because there is a wisdom about our next right step for us and our child and our parenting. Mm -hmm. um, but what it's, what it's really given me is, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't put, I just don't put canon in the box. I just don't. Um, I, I very rarely use the word autism, if I'm totally honest. And um, it's not that he doesn't, you know, he's just in normal school and do it. It's, he's quirky, he's himself. He is who he is, very unique. Um, but I don't tend to use, because I don't even really know anymore what it means, but he just gets to be, and I just get to be a bit more now that we understand how our minds work, you know, and I'm, when he's really panicking or stressing um, about his life, I can stay in a place that's more helpful to him if I'm not going off into my kind of mental what if, what if he can't cope at school, what if he can't, you know, I do do that sometimes. Because when he went to secondary school, I really was like, oh, oh it's gonna be all right, it's gonna make sure. Um, actually, when I, just day by day, you know, not going off too much. Um, and, you know, we feel it when we go off. He comes to me, he's like, oh, mom, I don't, I don't feel so good. <laughs> and I love that, I'm like, yeah. I don't feel so good either if I think about all the things I've got to do next week or if I'm going to go and do something new that feels scary, you know? So it's, it's understanding that he works in the same way as everybody else. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, we're all only ever up against what we're thinking right now. And just to come home to that presence, come home to the peacefulness of right now we don't have to do what we think we have to do we can do that when we need to do it beautiful cat thank you so much mm, and it, your being shines out on this call and your love and the space of love that you are bringing into your family around this I, it's very powerful for me thank you thanks for being here um now Dr. Bill, I'm going to give you 10 minutes because we do want to leave some space for q and A. I I think, but we'd also love to hear a little bit from you, just what you've seen in your own clinical experience has been helpful. Um, so if we could unmute Dr. Bill, I don't know if you can do that yourself, but um, please unmute yourself and go for it. There you are. The first thing I'm going to do is to say that I feel like some unfortunate bands in the early 60s that uh, were the opening act was the Beatles. <laughs> and then you were forced to go on the stage and you went, oh, crap, this is not <laughs> good. I feel that way that I've just had the Beatles open for me and and now I have to get on the stage. So being an old man, I'm, I'm going to take 90 seconds of my 10 minutes for an old man break. Um, and I'll be right back. Uh, um, it's a, I could call it a health break. I could call it a pee break, but I do much better with an empty bladder. So I will be right back. Okay. Well, thank you. You could have let, you can let me know in the chat privately, but anyway, um, we'll just carry on and I'll just see if there's anybody that wants to ask a live question right now to either Kat or to Gail believe are both practitioners of this understanding and work with special needs. So we'll pop their details um, on the recording to anybody that's listening, if you wanted to get in touch directly with them. Um, 
I'm assuming that's okay with you, Gail, if people wanted to contact you. Yeah. Uh, and I definitely know it's okay with my friend Kat. So, cause she's a very friendly person, but anybody got a question live right now that they wanted to, they heard. Yes. Annie, go for it. Hi Kat. A question for you. Um, as you've become more in present time consciousness and being with your son, um, has he become, is the aggression still there or has that subsided? So, <laughs> thanks, Annie. Hi, Annie. Um, so, how do I? He's just going into teenage dumb. <laughs> I feel like, oh, he's a teenager. <laughs> so, I could see, you know, if he's on, um, you know, if he gets really engaged in his gaming and all that, he could still be pretty aggressive. But um, he is. Um, I feel like I'm not, I'm not worried. I'm not worried about his behaviors in the same way that I was. And I also treat my son with the same, in the same way that I would treat my other kids, which is to really let him know if something is not okay with other people, if he's hurting other people, or if, you know? And um, I mean, he's got a, a absolutely wonderful nature and he's really very sensitive and loving also most of the time. So um so yeah but I am definitely encountering a stroppy teenager of which I've now got two in the house <laughs> and that's going to be its own bring its own challenges for sure but um you know with three boys together there is um definitely some aggression going on in my house at different times um but again I think I don't I don't spend too much time worrying about it if it happens we'll deal with it and there'll be consequences for him. Um, he won't get to play the game or there'll be a consequence for him in the same way, I guess, for my other kids, yeah. I hope that's okay for you, Annie. We're gonna circle back to Bill now, who's back from <laughs> where he's been. So, so you know, yeah, okay. Yeah, shall I go ahead? Go ahead, Bill. Just you know, time. years ago, I probably would have made some fib and said, you know, but I, you get to a, you get to near eighty and you just don't care, you know, you just don't care. So anyway, I, I was, I was not, I was serious about my statement about the Beatles because what I heard in this forty-five minutes from Gail and Catherine, um was easily a summary of the three principles in action, in life. I mean, uh, you could use this as a, as a teaching, those 45 minutes as a teaching of people's journey to realize that they had a guide inside that was a spiritual guide, a formless guide. Explain that however you want to but it's real. It's even though the scientists may say, I can't measure it. I can't touch it. I can't put it on a scale. Yeah. Okay. It's still, it's very much there. And so you heard each of them talk about realizing that they had a guide inside a spiritual guide that if they could fall into the present without resistance, not that it's, e not that it's always easy, but just to know that you're doing your best you can to accept this is the way it is right now. And, and, and then to try to be there and finding that something magical happened whenever you transitioned into that place of the present moment and the magic that occurs there. Um, I thought it was just beautiful. And the other, the other thing I heard, the third thing I heard was I don't have to know the whole journey. And I think I might have mentioned that last week that if that volcano in Yosemite goes off and covers the, the United States with a black dense cloud for uh, 15, 18 months, and you're trying to get from New York to Los Angeles, all you need is a car with a good set of headlights. You just need the next 80 to 100 feet. Mm. And I heard that from Gail and I heard it from Kat. Then I realized right now I'm okay, we're okay. And, we'll, and, and then when we don't know again, 
will try to stay as present as possible and and will you know move from resistance to acceptance and that guidance system will give us the next 80 feet and then the next 80 feet or the next three feet and then the next three feet <laughs> mm. i thought that was that was just uh, really um beautiful and and i heard you know they say crisis in in um chinese the symbol is two one is danger and the other is opportunity and the other is opportunity and what i hear from both gail and catherine is that this has been an opportunity they wouldn't have chosen it but they feel like they're a better human being and they've gone further in their journey of human beingness than they might not that they might have have traveled had they not had this experience wow 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 you know and the other thing i'm reminded and gail so speaks about that so beautifully in um you know that when kyle and and i'll bet what is your son's name cat i forget anyway but but the when they're at peace they're at peace what i heard was that i think everybody on this call could identify with when here's the first i'd love the first sentence of of tolstoy's anna karina mm -hmm. happy families are all alike every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way mm. that's true of individuals we have 47 people on this call of different ages different cultures different religious beliefs when we are at peace, when we are happy, we are all more like each other than we are like ourselves when we're not. Do I need to say that again? When we are at peace, all of us, with all of our differences, we are all more like ourselves. And, and those that that people that have been given these labels i don't care what the label is they're human beings and they have moments of peace and moments where they lack peace and when we all as human beings are at peace we are all more like each other than we are like ourselves when we're not at peace because we've gotten caught up in our thought created experience. I think Kat said that we all are more alike than different. We all feel what we think. And both of you came to realize that the internal world, as we talked about last week, of a, of the, a, a child or an adult that has this neurodiversity with all its gifts of creativity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera there is it's a an intense world and how many of us without this label of neurodiversity gets overwhelmed by the output of our brain the speed of it and 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 the i saw just the just the um the love and the um and the um and the realization that to the degree as possible, the quicker that I can stay in a state of, of well-being as much as I can, that's the, the, the best thing I have to offer my child when they're not. It, jumping in the quicksand with somebody has never worked out that well. Uh, my first wife and I used to do it routinely. We thought it was the least we could do for each other. But we you learn to to instead wait, what, what can I do to get my bearings back and, and take one step at a time? Anyway, I'm gonna stop right there. Uh, but boy, I, I felt like I just, uh, I just got a tutored um, for 45 minutes and I'm very grateful. Oh, Bill, that is so beautiful. I, I, me too. I thought they couldn't have done a better job of, no. of doing all of it, speaking to their experience and their wisdom and, and the understanding that has helped. Um, be I saw you know them be um but I'm going to move to questions and I'm going to start with something you just said there I don't care about the label um so Bill we've got a couple of questions in this direction uh one from Joe Fletcher and Mariella O'Brien and I'll just say them together because they're similar 
Um, how do you feel about labels? Are you for or against them in, in particular young people and generally giving people labels? And then Joe, to build on that, how do you use your label or story or diagnosis to, if you're autistic, to help others who have a similar diagnosis, but not become attached to the label? How do you be helpful if you've got that label, but not be attached? So something about labels here, um, Bill, what would you, what would you say to that? <laughs> you know, it's some, my, my association was when I heard the young man uh, that was with, um, with, uh, in rain, that, that was with um, the actor who played in Rain Man, mm. and I heard him perform. And somebody kept asking him what his who what his favorite this was and what his favorite that was. And the young man listened, and then he said, "You know, I have no favorites, and you're one of them." <laughs> Which I I thought was just an incredibly beautiful. It was it was from his heart. So he meant it. I have no favorites, and you're one of them. So I, I would say to that that. Each one of us is, I'll, I'll go to, and I want Kat and, and Gail to, to respond more, more than me, because my answer is very simple. At your own level of understanding, do what your wisdom guides you to do with that. The mm -hmm. label is a, is a, is a it, it can be used as, as a helpful thing. If there is disability to get services, this, talking about neurodiversity, is not, it's taking the judgment out of it right or wrong, but if there is disability, even if, it, if the label helps where the person is right now in their functioning, they need services and that are available, then I think you use that label knowing that that's all it is. It's just the best attempt to describe that a person right now needs, needs this assistance and in this part of their life. So that would, but I, I would go back to both Gail and Kat's state of listening. It doesn't mean you don't try to educate yourself. And then you, at each step of your way, whether it's in your, your journey through the principles and your journey in understanding what people call, have labeled autism, then you follow your wisdom. That would, that would be mine. I have no, I, I'm no expert in that. I think you follow your wisdom. Mm. Oh, that's great. And I, I, I love that. And I'm just going to invite Gail because labels is something that comes up a lot. Um, so Gail, uh, would you anything to add to that for you? Yeah, actually, I love what Bill said. I, I'll, I'll ditto all that Bill said. And I think that um, sometimes people get really stubborn about labels and they're against them. And exactly what you said about getting services. Um, I do think it's good to have those services and that support. Um, so for me, I kind of like play the system where I need to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and it, it sounds crazy, but you know, my son, he was in a program and he needs a one-on-one, -on -one, but um, to have that approved by the state, we really had to play up all of his, play up everything. And it was real kind of foreign to me because I, I don't tend to focus on those things, but for this, for this reason, we did so he could get his one-on-one. -on -one. So sometimes things like that serve a purpose. And the other thing I'll just say about labels is that, you know, it could just help with understanding, especially when you have a young child and you're not, somebody is really not understanding why is my son never looking at me in the eye you know what's going on I think labels can be good in that effect that we can see how the brain with somebody that has autism processes differently and you know just understanding that goes a really long way but then again like Kat said you know you don't want the label to become a box mm -hmm. um so I think you can have it both ways, is my opinion. Um, mm. Label serves its purpose, but you don't want to be squashed down by it. Kat, anything to add to that? Not really. Mm. <laughs> that was lovely, yeah. It, okay, well, I think labels, um, as I'm going to quote Dr. Bill, don't tell you really who you are because who we are is formless, spiritual being. But the label can tell you 
where your brain processor is and like you say can help you get services so it's it's just it's not really defining you in essence just for anyone who who we can get think we are our, our label and and that's really not true we have one but it's not who we are so I just want to just offer that to anyone who's maybe new to this understanding that's we're very clear that who we are is formless spiritual energy just being our true self I'm going to come to another question now Bill um, now uh, actually I'm going to start with the ladies this time because it's a child question how do you help a 10 year old understand that a world doesn't understand how her brain works I'm going to come to you Kat so how would you help a 10 year old who is different understand that the world doesn't necessarily understand her and maybe the expectation of being super smart doesn't always fit all autistic brains some some struggle but what would you say to a 10 year old child who doesn't understand that the world doesn't understand them oh, i relate <laughs> now you do that's what i'm asking you girl. Oh, I, I mean i relate to the girl you know <laughs> I <don't understand> me. <laughs> um you know me too <laughs> mm. um I, I would i would um I think I would try to explain how her brain worked, um, that we feel our thinking and, you know, people will be doing the same thing as us. Um, and I think that's where I would orientate it around. I love, um, I mean, I work with the young people a lot and it's a real passion of mine because I kind of rightly or wrongly, I like sort of showing them people are really unreliable. You know, you don't want to put all your, <laughs> well-being in other people because they gonna do all sorts of crazy stuff you know like we do sometimes um and so you know a lot of us don't really understand I didn't understand how my brain worked and it really looked like everyone and everything had to change for me to be okay and then I came to understand how my brain worked and I realized that's not true I'm okay and other people are going to be wherever they are so um i suppose it's directing her within her own resources i would say mm. you know her own creative amazing brain and capacity to um yeah you know we we are all only up against our own thinking and, pe and people can have all sorts of ideas about who we are and what we are and you know they sometimes or most often don't really align with what we think that should be. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else relates to that, but I really relate to that. Say, that. say that last sentence again, Kat. What did you say that, what you said? I just said, I don't know if anyone else relates to that, but I really relate to that too. You know? Relate to what? Relate to what? To, just to the young, you know, to, to wanting people to understand me better, oh, you know, right. and mm -hmm. yeah. Mm hmm mm. Anything to add, Bill or Gail, to how to help a 10 year old yeah, understand her brain? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have much to add. I've never been in that exact kind of situation, but um, I think maybe letting, well, I know that this is different, but I'll just say this as, a, as an example. So my son, Kyle is not verbal, but he makes a lot of sound and noise. And um, he might be in a store, we might take him into Target and he's really happy to be there. So he'll yell, ah, you know, like that is his happy noise. And um, we kind of explain to him, even though I don't know at what level he gets it, that <clears throat> sometimes people aren't really sure when they see a man doing that. You know, we try to kind of explain to him the perspective of somebody else, what they might think. Mm. Um, you know, sometimes we'll say, you know, they might be afraid even, and there's no reason to be afraid of you, but that's what somebody else might think. So let's see if we can tone that down a little. And sometimes that toning down works and then other times it just really doesn't. But um, I don't know, I guess just letting somebody, letting a child know even that everybody's gonna see things differently and, and often they just don't understand. 
they don't understand why you're doing this or why you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. Lovely. I've, I've actually got another question, Joe, uh, Bill, which I'd love to come to, to you on, unless you want to add something to this one. Yeah, I, I would like to add, uh, yeah. you know, just briefly. Um, no, go for it. You know, what I heard from, again, both uh, is, number one, if the person was able to, to verbalize in, in whatever way they were, first of all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't explain anything unless, unless I felt it would be helpful. And, then, and, and especially if, if it wasn't asked, but, but if it was asked, I would, I would first of all, really listen. I would try to understand to whatever degree that the child was able to, to where the question came from in their experience. And, and, um, and so I would, I would really, um, I would try to make sure I, there, I had a, a friend of mine who, who had an African American lady that, um, that worked for them that after she was a wonderful wise lady and after she raised her seven children, but she started taking foster care children in, and this was in Florida. And, and the reason was they gave her five-year-old, a seven-year-old Asian, an 11-year-old. It, it didn't matter because they, they usually used her as a last resort and before they institutionalized these children. And why? Because she listened. She listened with an open heart, and uh, and I know we, yeah, to the degree that we're not in fear, we can listen with an open heart. The other thing I heard from Gail, which I thought was beautiful, and remember last week when we talked about my sister with severe dementia, uh, and and gibberish for two and a half days, and Linda said to her from the heart, Peggy, it's really okay, isn't it? It's re it's okay, isn't it? And after two and a half days of gibberish, she said, Linda, it's really okay. That, that soul, that place, that place of, of where we're all the same is worth speaking to even because it's beyond the intellect. Mm. And I love the Hebrew saying, words spoken from the heart often reach, or they, I don't think they even have often, it's just reach the heart. <laughs> and, and I think of the lady that had failed special education that transformed 48 hours in the hospital after watching Sid's Long Beach lectures twice. And, and she said, you'll never have to see me again. And, she, and I didn't. And she said, you know, I really didn't understand one word that man said. So it wasn't his words. It was the feeling. And that's what I heard from both Gail and Kat. Again, I'm just echoing what I heard from them is in the right feeling, you'll listen with an open heart and you'll speak with an open heart. Mm -hmm. And don't don't decide ahead of time what's going to happen because you you don't have any idea what might happen. I love that. Um, we, we've only got about five minutes, but I do have a kind of double barrel question that I'd really like you to kick off with Bill and then anything that Kat and Gail would like to add. Um, and it's kind of a head, there are two questions in this. And the first question is, aren't we all somewhere on the autistic spectrum? And is, is that, you know, is that true? And that's kind of part one. And then I'm going to, that comes from Kelly. And then I'm going to subtext that with Joe's question, because it kind of answers it for me in a way. So this is Joe's a little bit long, so stick with me. Um, Joe says, when my thoughts start to speed up, it feels like my personal mind can become like a runaway train and out of control. At this point, it appears to take over. And I become charged with an energy and it makes it really difficult for me to control my urges. And for example, keeping interrupting others when they're speaking, getting too excited or being annoying <laughs> to others. Uh, how can this understanding help me when I'm in that state where it seems that my personal mind is completely out of control and it appears from personal experience that I have no free will. So that's part two, but I am just going to go right in and say, me too, Joe. 
I am that annoying, overexcited, interrupting person from time to time. So I don't know. I think the that may answer the first one. We all we all can get caught up. But but really over to you, Bill. What would you say about are we all on the autistic spectrum? And what would help Joe when he feels out of control? Over to you. Well, are we all on the autistic spectrum? You know, I think we've said, you know, what what person on this call hasn't gotten so stressed that they weren't really very sensitive to, they were dealing with so much in their own experience in their head that they were less attentive to other people's needs and even, even sensitive to seeing or what those were. So of course, because um, in all, all of the things that are on the criteria I think most of us have, have had periods of time, whether it's ADHD and or autism that we've met and many other, you know, and many other things on the DSM-5, right? There was one study from England by, uh, that showed, uh, it was a 50 year study that showed by mid, mid age, 86% of people had met for at least, at least one DSM-5 criteria at some time in their life. And then they evolved into another one. And it was, so the answer is, we're all human beings. We're all spiritual beings who have a brain and have a relationship between our spiritual nature and our psychological and physical nature. And depending on our level of understanding, we're not frightened by our experience, no matter what it is. And and, and it doesn't mean that you're wrong or stupid if you're still frightened by the experience that you're creating that seems like it's being created by your brain, but it's, it's, it's your creating the experience from in your re, un, level of understanding with that output. But as, as I think Kat, both people said, you can't force yourself, but to the degree that you understand the system that you cannot have an experience without, it's a, that isn't a thought created experience. And to the degree, as I think I've probably said a number of times, to the degree is the only, the only clue I can give Joel and others is somebody asked me recently, what do you do when you're in the midst of a thought thunderstorm? And that's what, that's what I hear people talking about, right? whatever your neurodiversity, whatever the speed of your brain, it's, it's the only thing that can, can spew out is thoughts. That's all, right? So in the, when you're in the midst of a thought, and I, I really went to not knowing rather than to spew some thing that I'd said 84 times before or 840. And what came out of my mouth was, in response to what do you do when you're in the midst of a thought thunderstorm? I said, you know, what, what do I really do? I thought, and that what the answer was, I do the best that I can to be where I am. I'll say that again, that's all I know to do. And given my level of understanding, it's going to evolve over time in the speed that I get there and the what and the clarity and the transition. You know how they fade from one slide, slide to another on a slideshow? What if you had a slide it, that it took 30 seconds or three minutes to go from one slide to the other? Well, there's going to be times like that. But if you're clear that I'm what I'm going to do right now. What I'm not going to do is do battle with my thinking. I'm not going to be, as Gail said, in resistance. My first step is to accept I'm in a thought thunderstorm and I'm going to do the best that I can to fall into the present where I am. And to, and to depending on your level of understanding, that will sometimes be smoother than others. And over time, you'll see that that transition from the thought thunderstorm to the present gets without effort because you can't do it as they both pointed out. You can't do it with your intellect. You can't do it cognitively. It has to be from a realization within your own consciousness. 
of what that the wisdom will guide you. So you do the do the best. The, my advice is to do the best that you can to be where you are. Beautiful. And the other, the other will take care of itself effortlessly. That that really addresses that question and a few others that that I haven't been able to ask, but they were in that general direction. We're we're not going to ask any more questions tonight. Um, but I really I cannot thank our panel enough. You've been absolute rock stars and legends and taught through your being, as Bill has said, from the space of love. Absolutely. And what you've said has gone into our hearts. So Gail and Kat, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. And, and you're, you know, how beautiful, you're two beautiful women who have just discovered that, you know, it's all about love and our capacity to 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 be love and it's very profound listening to you um as you will all know from the beginning of the call we we're going to be doing another two of these and the subject matter is going to be adhd and other brain kind of un disorders you could call them but but we call them uh, assets and um you know, dyslexia and that kind of thing. So we're going to be talking about that in January the 4th, 7 p.m. UK time. And anyone on this call listening will get um, a, a link to that. So you'll be able to, to join the neurodiversity session and we'll do one masterclass with mostly Bill. And then the second one, same thing, a couple of us telling stories and some live Q&A. So we'll, we'll do the same format in the new year, which will be a joy. But once again, Bill, you know, such a beautiful space was created here uh, between us. Again, the space of love. And, and I really love what you've brought to today as well. Your, your humility and respect for our speakers has really touched me. Oh, I'm crying now because um, you have so much knowledge and wisdom and yet you're still willing to be in the humility of, of you know, honoring others knowledge and experience and also to be willing to be willing not to know and see what comes alive fresh in the moment cannot thank you enough bill um for the you know i'm just going to say it many people who listen to the first series will know that i basically stalked bill and said come on bill we've got to get your wisdom down we've got to i'm going to get all of these transcribed so at least we've got transcriptions of your knowledge and wisdom and i think it's inspired bill to to write, to write at least three books in his head and maybe one will get in the next year. Um, but it's always a joy. And I'll send the links to, to Kat and Gail if you want to get in touch and have some, they're both teachers of this understanding and, and they, they may well be able to support you in some way. So that's it for today. We're getting some lovely comments, Bill. Really insightful and beautiful. Thank you, everybody. So helpful. You know, off you go to Christmas, everyone. Even if you're not listening to this, it's not Christmas, but, you know, bring the Christmas spirit in your heart. Let us all be the space of love. The world needs it. Thank you so much for being here. That's a wrap. Love, 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 <laughs> love, 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 love.